The first shot of Fritz Lang's The Big Heat is a close-up of a gun. That gun is then picked up and used by a man to shoot himself. A woman hears the noise, walks down a flight of stairs, and sees the dead man bleeding over a desk. She doesn't cry, she doesn't scream, she doesn't even rush to see if he's still alive. She just coldly walks up and opens a letter that the dead man left to the local DA. She inspects it and then makes a call. But not to the police. She makes a call to a suspiciously looking powerful man. If this isn't the best way of starting a noir, what is? The Big Heat tells the story of Crusader cop Dave Bannion as he takes on a politically powerful crime syndicate. The narrative is simple enough, but quickly the complexities arise and Lang lays out the ruthlessness and violence of this world. Film historian and director Gavin Lambert put it best when he said, The basic material of The Big Heat resembles that of a score of American thrillers, but a personal imagination transforms it and relates it to the artist's own created world, rich in symbols of evil prescience. One of those biggest symbols is embodied by Lee Marvin in a truly nightmarish role that still sends shivers down the spine. About an hour into the film, he commits an act so vile, so repulsive, so brutal, that will certainly dispel any notions that classic Hollywood was ever safe, that it didn't take risks, that it was naive and repressed. Without spoiling anything, suffice to say that you'll never look at a coffee pot quite the same way. The counterpoint to this evil lies in the dirty, hairy prototype that came 20 years before Clint Eastwood gave it life. Glenn Ford carries himself like a blunt instrument, a self-righteous deliverer of justice that will stop at nothing to clean up his dirty city. He's lost it all except his thirst for revenge, getting increasingly cruel and relentless as the movie progresses. This is to say he's becoming the people he hates. But that's noir for you, and that's Lang having fun with the genre and its conventions. In fact, where Lang impresses the most is in the treatment of violence, how it connects. At a time that blood and brutality have become trivial, seen in every sort of way from the horrifying and shocking to the lighthearted and cartoonish, Lang found a way to root violence in psychology and the propulsiveness of the drama. More than showing it, he makes you feel it. That's craft, that's cinema, that's Fritz Lang's The Big Heat. Force of Evil is one of a kind, a breed between classic noir and the modern gangster film. It's thrilling, expertly executed, and has just the right dose of melodrama. Based on Ira Wolford's 1943 novel Tucker's People, Abraham Polonsky's film tells the story of a young and crooked Jewish lawyer of humble Lower East Side origins, Joe Morse, who wants to consolidate all the small-time numbers racket operators into one big powerful operation. He needs a straight-as-an-arrow older brother Leo to play ball. What follows is an epic clash between class, family, and the very nature of capitalism in America. What it is, what it can be, and what above all else should be. Polanski roots the noir aspects of the film in complex and explosive family dynamics, interweaving the drama with gangster elements expertly into surprisingly powerful effect. In fact, this may very well be the closest Hollywood ever got to The Godfather before The Godfather was made. There's that family is the most important thing I believe in America, capitalism fuels the nation blood cursing through these gritty New York veins, down to the character of Freddy and his remarkable resemblance to John Cazale's now iconic Freddo. Real New York locations play a big part in the film's mood, steeping it in grim realism, a slight departure from the glamorous noir world of fedora-wearing P.I.s traversing through sleazy but compellingly looking nightclubs, coaxing hapless hat-check girls into doing them favors. Force of Evil is set in a world of small-time crooks and blue-collar families, following mostly men who wrestle against their inner cowardness and sense of place in the booming world around them. They inhabit cramped and sweaty little rooms, dingy restaurants, and sordid nightclubs. There's no glitz and glamour here, just a down and dirty reality experienced by many at the time, including Polonsky himself. In an interview from 1999 with the LA Times, Polonsky was asked why his movies often paint a dark view of relationships and morality. He replied, I look at it as reality. 
It's worth noting that Force of Evil was the second project from John Garfield's Enterprise Productions, an independent production company Garfield formed after leaving Warner Brothers in 1946. His first film, Robert Rawson's Body and Soul, dealt with the corruption and the moral progress of a man who sells his soul and then decides he wants it back. Similarly, in Force of Evil, Joe ends up with the same realization. At one point he even says, I didn't have enough strength to resist corruption, but I was strong enough to fight for a piece of it. It's this type of oblique and self-effacing writing that also defines the film's unique and gut-punching sensibility. The things that people say, ironically enough, ended up playing a big part in Polonsky's life outside the movie world. A committed Marxist, Polonsky joined the Communist Party in the 1930s and even went as far as editing a left-wing newspaper, activities which would catch the attention of the House of Un-American Activities Committee in the early 1950s. When Polonsky refused to testify before Congress in 1951, he was called, quote, a very dangerous citizen, and his career came to a screeching halt, having been blacklisted from Hollywood. In the decade that followed, Polonsky depended on friends fronting for him in order to get any work made and sold in Hollywood. These experiences would later be the basis of a Martin Ritt film called The Front, starring Woody Allen and Zero Mostel. Polonsky wrote a draft, but ended up disavowing the film since he felt that the final product wasn't true to his original vision. Looking back, it's fairly obvious that Force of Evil, a film rooted in a strong anti-capitalistic message, was a dangerous movie in the eyes of Senator Joseph McCarthy and everyone perpetuating the shameful witch hunt that destroyed the lives and careers of so many people in a country that prides itself on having freedom of speech. Fortunately, Polunsky's highly sophisticated work remains, and it's the sort of one-of-a-kind vision that leaves us wondering just what kind of career a genius like him could have had.